This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and the Events and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to the Hawke Centre at the University of South Australia. In doing so, I take this opportunity to acknowledge that the University of South Australia is on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. We are thrilled to be presenting tonight's event, Can Seaweed Save the World? in partnership with Warm Adelaide's Planet Talks program. And I would like to thank Lisa Bailey, our producer of Planet Talks, um, for her support with tonight's event. Thank you. And also a warm welcome to our speakers, Steve and Katrina, and of course, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's discussion will be facilita facilitated by the wonderful Professor Chris Daniels. He is wonderful. Um, Chris is currently the presiding member and chair of the Green Adelaide Landscape Board. And as he just told me, he's involved in 30 different environmental groups. And apparently you're supposed to be retired. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> apparently. Um, Chris is also an adjunct professor of biology in clinical and health sciences at UniSA and adjunct professor of zoology at the University of Adelaide. So please join me in welcoming Professor Chris Daniels along with our speakers who will um, introduce and uh, take over proceedings. Thank you. thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Jacinda. I'm really thrilled he to be here to facilitate this incredibly interesting discussion that's really provocatively titled, Can Seaweed Save the World? And you would have seen on the, the slides here, I put up a, a couple from Paul Chifurka, who is a, a scientist and a, and a modeler who developed a way of calculating the mass of meat on the planet. At about 10,000 years before the current epoch, there was about 300 million tonnes of meat, of vertebrates, shuffling around the planet. And 96% of those were wild animals, 4% was us. By the time we got to 2015, that number of tonnes, millions of tonnes of meat on the planet had grown from 300 to 1,850 million tonnes of meat. A massive increase in life on the planet. Nearly all of that is domestic animals and humans. The infographic that showed of that mass, 4% is wild, um, wild mammals, 34% um, is humans, 62% is livestock, of which 35% is cattle. So in other words, the meat on the planet is effectively us and cows. And we have about 1.5 billion cows roaming around the planet at the moment. So our question tonight is not to think about what that actually means in, in many of the aspects of environmental challenge, but to think about what this means for climate change. Um, and in particular to consider one, one aspect which is around methane production. And so we're very lucky to have two people here who can shed some light on the problem, but also on some solutions. And these solutions really pertain to seaweed. And the seaweed in general, which does a whole array of different things that one of our speakers will spend some time on. And then of course, one specific type of seaweed, which is asparagopsis. Um, and we're here to focus on that as well. So to lead us through the relationship between cattle, climate change and seaweed, we have Professor Katrina McLeod. Now she's Executive Director at the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania, and is also the lead in the Sustainable Marine Resources Program within the Marine Bioproducts CRC, which is based at Flinders. 
So Katrina has a broad experience, knowledge and passion for and about seaweeds in general, and of course their connection to humans and to the whole trophic environmental marine uh, situation. And then of course we have Dr. Steve Miller. Um, his CV is very eclectic and peripatetic. He has moved from being a, an, an academic and then into corporate and then into entrepreneurial space. Uh, but he is currently the creator and director of CH4 Global. And CH4 Global is actively building strategic partnerships for growing and producing asparagopsis. And he has the secret here to saving the world. So please be very, very kind to, to Steve. Uh, Steve is also an Adelaide boy. Uh, he did his degree at the University of Adelaide. And in fact, he and I did physiology two together um, way back in the 1970s. So there you go. I've got some pictures of Steve in the, the university days, but I don't think I'll, I'll share that tonight. <laughs> Okay, so what we want to do is break down the challenge between um, methane, cattle, um, and asparagopsis. So I want to start with some big questions about climate change, methane, and cows. So I'll start now then with you, Steve. Um, what is it about methane? Why is methane a, a greenhouse gas issue? And why will reducing methane make a, a real difference to climate change? So... First of all, thank you to the organisers, to Katrina, to Chris, to everyone involved for the opportunity to talk on this topic. It's one I spend a lot of time on, uh, in particular as it relates to climate change. If we think about it today, the finger gets pointed a lot at fossil fuels. They're the big problem. Let's stop using it, let's do this, that. Um, and we, we sort of go back to an agreement that the leaders of almost every country on the world made in 2015 in Paris uh, at COP21, as it's called, the Conference of the Parties, that we should focus on carbon dioxide, a byproduct of fossil fuels and, and a variety of other things. And the single biggest endpoint, right, the measure of success of what we're doing is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as measured. Um, in a couple of specific locations around the world. And from 2015, every country said what would be their commitments to make to lowering that. And last year, and the year, the year before the virtual one in the last two COPs, the countries increased their commitments to doing that with the goal of effectively halving the amount of carbon dioxide by 2030. 2030 is a very important date from, a, from a changes in weather patterns. So we've made zero progress. Concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has continued to go up. The only time that it's gone down in recorded history, but certainly since 2015, was 2020 in COVID, when literally the world shut down and we used dramatically less fossil fuels um, for transportation and other things. Went down about three or four percent. Rebounded back the next year and more, and in the last calendar year, uh, went up about another 2.9 percent. So that's the reality of what's happening. From a climate change impact, we've made zero progress. And the way I look at it is in last year's uh, COP26, there was a lot of recognition of that that said, well, methane's also a really high amount of gas. And in fact, it's 86 times more potent than is carbon dioxide at heat in the atmosphere. And its lifetime is about 12.4 years. And then it breaks down to CO2 and water vapor. So, you know, the, the discussion really was around, well, if we could address methane, we could actually help bring down the impact of climate change and warming in there. In fact, the calculations are if we could bring it down by 30%, which is a goal that most of the countries around the world, 105 or so, now 150, uh, have agreed on. Lowering methane by 30% around the world would 
reduced by about 0.4 or 0.5 of a degree. Given we've gone up 1.1 degree since we measured, that's a pretty impactful one when you look at what's happening on weather patterns today. So the recognition globally that methane's really important from that. So then you say, where's it come from? And it comes from a couple of key sources, unlike carbon dioxide, it's really, it, it's down to a couple of sources. Um, agriculture, more broadly, and the oil and gas industry. And oil and gas um, is the big focus for it. How do we close off pipelines? It should seem really easy to do that. But I'm here to tell you it's not the largest source. Not only is agriculture the largest source of methane, cows burping, not farting, burping is the single largest source of methane on the planet. And in fact, the impact of that, the size of that problem is, I'll give you the number, it's 12.9 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents. But I'll dimension that for you. That is more than the entire total greenhouse gas emissions of China. The numbers two, three, four, and five emitters as a country, US, EU27, India and Russia put together is less than what the cows on the planet burping is. So that's the magnitude of the problem, but it's also the magnitude of the opportunity if there are ways to do something about it. So I'll pause with that, turn it back to Chris, because I think we get into that question later. Otherwise, I get, I get going and yeah. Have to well, I do actually want to follow up on that point, Steve, because if there are 1.5 billion cows on the planet and they are 35% of the biomass of meat on the planet, what would be the, f the effect of reducing the methane production of cattle by 10%? Um, it's gonna be in the, in the nature of a, a gigaton and a half, three times Australia's total greenhouse gas emissions, just by 10%. Uh, and there are various ways that companies like ourselves and others, there's about a dozen different ways and that'll come up in later conversations about how to address this because it's such an in-your-face problem. We can't get CO2 levels down. We can't do enough at scale in the next seven years to get to that magnitude that's required to lower greenhouse gases by close to 50% by 2030. We have seven years left. 2015 was eight years ago, and we've made negative progress. We've done lots of things. Let's not, not uh, I don't mean to say we've done nothing. We've done lots of things, and it's great prep work, but it's not for a 2030 goal. It's for a 2040 and a 2050 goal as we transition away from fuels, just like we need to transition away from uh, you know, livestock as a protein source uh, over the next few decades. But we have an immediate problem of how do we address greenhouse gases at the scale we need to today? And is this going to create a challenge for farmers or for agriculture worldwide where they will be asked to regulate their methane production, so, come up with solutions to reduce methane so if you're a cattle already, farmer? That's already started. So I'll give you a couple of examples of things that have happened already on that same front. Uh, one in the Southern Hemisphere and one in the Northern Hemisphere. So New Zealand decided, uh, about a bit more than a year ago, that it not only would regulate methane, but it would tax methane. So farmers will be subject to a tax. It starts at a relatively small number, year after next, I think, but then ramps itself up to quite a substantial tax on the methane that cows produce. So one cow, on average, across those 1.5 billion, produces about 100 kilos of methane. That's 8.6 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents a year. It's a fair bit. Um, so that's an example of what's being done. Most of the rest of the world don't necessarily like that, and certainly farmers don't. Um, so the other way that's been looked at, also not particularly good if you're in the agriculture, and I'll use the Netherlands as an example. So if you were to sit there when you go home tonight and Google Netherlands and see what's happened in the last six months, the Netherlands government set aside somewhere around 21, 22 billion euros in 2021 to mandatorily acquire farming properties and stop them. Now, not only for a methane problem, but cows urinate nitrogen if they're oversupplied with it. That's also a problem around the world. And they were the two that the Dutch government wanted to mitigate. They didn't think there was any other solution than just have less cows. 
So they said, I'm going to buy 25% of all of the farm stock for farms that have been in five generations of farming. What do you think the population did then? Drove tractors down the road, shut it down, the Minister for Agriculture resigned. So there are examples of things that are being tried, not successfully. One of the other ways, which we and others are focused on, can you reduce that methane those cows produce without doing any harm to the animal, to the environment, and do so in a way that's productive and puts money in farmers' pockets? So. So that's a really good segue. So you can see that we've got this enormous challenge from cattle producing methane. Methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas. Um, and there's regulatory change which will challenge social structure unless we can find a solution. Which brings us to seaweed. And so over to you, Katrina. Tell us, what is seaweed to start with? Seaweed is effectively your marine plants. So they're the primary producers in our marine and aquatic systems. Um, they're, in many ways, they're as diverse as the plants that you see on land. Um, many are the foundational species that you'd have seen the slides earlier on going through. Um, the foundational species that effectively act like forests underwater. Um, but they come in all types and forms. We have three, you know, for, in common parlance, they'd be reds, greens, and browns, simple as that. Um, and they have very different properties, exactly like terrestrial plants, depending on, you know, which species where they are, and they have niches within, within that, those ecosystems. And uh, the Asparagopsis is just one of those, and it has a really interesting ecological niche. Um, and the, the um, bromoforms that they produce are a defense mechanism for them. They, they actually are a way of making sure that they uh, fend off predators and things that want to eat them. And, and um, so it is, it's very much a defense mechanism. Asparagopsis sits within that. It's not a forest time. It's a filamentous red algae um, that is it's commonly known as harpoon weed. It's an opportunistic species, so it's boom and bust in places. It takes advantage. Um, harpoon weed, because it has little barbs on, on um, the adult stages that hook onto things so it can move around. Um, and this unique property that it has, um, I'm actually not sure how they came across it. Steve, that might be something that you could tell me. Um, but it, it is quite unique, and it's quite unique to this species in this group. And it's very unique to Australia, because um, endemic uh, asparagopsis, particularly the armata, which has been shown to have um, um, more production of, of this um, chemical, the bromoforms, um, is unique to southern Australia, to um, the southern hemisphere, Australia and New Zealand. You do get another species in warmer waters, um, Taxiformis, um, and in, you could say that it's a unique opportunity for Australia because of the nature of this species as an invasive species. Um, it's, it's one of the, the most invasive species in the, the northern hemisphere. It's not used to being there, so they really don't like it up there. It's, a, it's on the top five species uh, on their watch list, and so it, it's something you could not grow at scale in water in, in the Northern Hemisphere, which provides it as a unique opportunity in Australia, um, and particularly in Southern Australia for, for the Omata one. So are you able to tell us? I, I, I can shed some light on it. How they came across it? Um, there was a Canadian researcher living in the eastern provinces of Canada, uh, Rob Kinley is his name, who now uh, is in Australia, but one of the local farmers had come down to Rob and said, cows are healthier, what's going on? They're eating seaweed, off, and they're eating brown seaweeds actually, just off that had washed up on the shore in the, in the provinces. So that got Rob intrigued as he was doing part of his uh, PhD work and the prep stuff, and it sort of led him into healthier, there's some changes in immune function. He was a physiologist, so he was interested in the digestion, and one of the things that cows do is produce hydrogen and methane as a product of what they do. So he ran some of those samples uh, through um, a, an, a, an artificial stomach model that he had cows and said, oh, this reduces methane, a little bit, not a huge amount, but 10, 15 percent, I believe. And about that time, he got recruited to come work for CSIRO in Townsville. 
and right next door to Townsville, perhaps James Cook University. So, you know, sort of knocked on the door, shortening it significantly, and said, let's go dive for some seaweeds. And they went off uh, to the Barrier Reef, collected a couple of dozen species, one of which was Asparagopsis taxiformis. Brought it back to the lab, ran on them all in, you know, and they gave the sort of expected lowish numbers, except he went home one night, came back, and it had shut down completely methane production in that artificial model. He said, that can't be right. I've got to run it again. Ran it again the same time. Ran it again the third time and said, there's something unique about that. So the two of them teamed up and went to Meat and Livestock Australia and said, we want to run some trials in sheep and, and beef cattle is where they started. Um, so MLA provided some. They found effectively the same benefit, very high levels, certainly above 80% reductions in methane almost immediately that now we know from some subsequent research persists for as long as the cow is consuming this. And by consuming, I need to make sure you all understand, this is not as a feed. This is a very small amount, less than one half of 1% of the total daily diet is what's used. So if a cow eats 10 kilos, this is 50 grams, a couple of teaspoons full in their entire diet for the entire day. So the material is very good at doing what it does if you get good quality material. So that spurred a whole bunch of research that they filed some intellectual property about how you use it. Not how you make it, not how you grow it, not how you propagate it, none of that. Uh, but how you can use it and the benefits in terms of methane or carbon equivalent reduction. So that's, that's sort of how it came and about. And the focus then became on the broma form. So again, I'll qualify. So as, a, as the asparagopsis, um, all seaweeds produce these halogenated yeah. volatile compounds. They're part, it's part of their natural metabolic processing. So when they're out in the ocean, they do it, equilibrates atmosphere and the like. And this is the only species out of sort of 10,000-ish of these reds, greens, and browns that's been found to date, and about 500 or so have been actively looked at, that actually stores and concentrates these materials. And it does so in these little vesicles that was a subject of one person's PhD thesis that's continued on the work now, Nick Paul. Um, these little gland cells, they're called. And so if you can, and, and they, there's about 100 Bromoform, a word that's used often, is an example of one of them. It happens to have the highest concentration. All of the others are active as well, just there's less of them in there. So when someone uses the word bromoform, it's really, to me, it means it's all of them, because it's a collective one. If you, if you utilize the plant itself, um, you're, they're all being supplied in totality. So if you can keep these little vesicles intact and keep them in there and they want to get out because they're volatile, they want to escape. And the whole objective is to keep them inside, not have them escape to the atmosphere. And if you can do that successfully and then formulate it and provide it to cattle in the right amounts, in the right formulations, voila, you have this magical 80 plus percent reduction in methane. And so could that potentially work with other foregut digesters, yes. other ruminants like goats? Yeah, all types of ruminants, goats, camels, you know, deer, sheep, um, and there's plenty of those. It just happens that cattle produce substantially more than all of those others. Sure. And then there are the hindgut fermenters that I suppose, would it, can it work with those or they're just not important? Not Rabbits, for that horses, benefit, those yeah. Sorts. So the, the, the methane is produced in, the, in that foregut. Um, I have been asked by people who don't want to have their name said about whether it also works on humans. It does, it, it does not, unfortunately, so. <laughs> oh, sorry, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so which leads to, of course, to both of you, other environmental benefits um, that can be provided by uh, seaweeds in general, but asparagopsis in particular. You want to Another uses, so when we think about the, yeah. the uses, not just here in this case. So, um, well, th there's the marine bioproduct CRC based out of here in, um, in Flinders Uni that is actively looking at that. What are the other um, opportunities and potential benefits from seaweed production? Um, my background is, is much more in the environmental interaction space. 
So um, I would, I don't, I'm a big advocate for seaweed now in that space because seaweed has a really important role to play. Um, back to the question you asked me earlier, which was around what's the role of seaweed in, mm -hmm. in the, So seaweed is, is uh, much like terrestrial plants and a really natural sink for all those nutrients. That, that go into our marine systems. Um, seaweeds are the main way to take that up. Seaweeds and phytoplankton, so the phytoplankton are the microalgae. Um, so when you have um, large populations, large aquaculture facilities where we're putting significant nutrients into our coastal systems, it's seaweed that actually, and, and algae and microalgae that respond to that. And so the ability to use seaweeds to actually take that up, and, and so one of the projects we've been involved with quite extensively is around a thing called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, where you look to grow different trophic levels together to try and offset any you know, adverse nutrient inputs um, from one. And I've been working on that for oh, probably 15 years on and, off, on and off now. And what's largely become apparent to me is it's not an easy thing to do as a single business proposition. It's something you do at a bay-wide scale. And at a bay-wide scale, you're now looking at how that system integrates with the natural system. And um, so the potential to utilize different seaweeds, perhaps not so much asparagopsis in this space, because although it does need um, the, the, it does take up nutrients, um, the farming proposition side of that for asparagopsis, I don't think would work as well in an open water system to, to nutrient upkeep. This is much more suited to things like the kelps um, that, that you can grow for other purposes. And the MBCRC, so the win-win the in there, and you know, I've taken a long time to answer it, the win-win in there is you can actually get a good environmental outcome alongside a really good production opportunity. And so that's what we're looking at. And have you been working on that as an example with the, the salmon industry in Tasmania and the need to remove the nitrogen from that, that system? Yes, certainly. It's been something that's been explored uh, in relation to, um, well, that's the, the whole premise where you need those high-end uh, fed um, fish of some sort in order to actually to do that. Or it can be, a, you, humans can be our nutrient source. But yes, salmon is one example that it's been used with to try and um, balance the nutrients levels within that ecosystem to try and get things back to ensure the natural stability remains. Um, Steve, you started to, to mention this about scale and the difference between f farming and oh. harvesting. Now, there's obviously some, there's some ethical and moral issues around harvesting, but then there's just the straight out practical. So how do you farm asparagopsis? So I'm going to sort of divide it up a little bit. You can grow, as, as Katrina just said, you can grow as asparagopsis grows wildly in the Gulf here. It's actually uh, both species. In fact, South Australia is uniquely the only location in the world where both species grow on the same patch of sand or sides. The only place. West Australia might sort of say, hey, we've got both species, but one's in the south and one's way up in the north, and it happens to be a couple thousand kilometers between them. Not true in South Australia. So it's uniquely for there, they have different seasons. But like, like terrestrial plants, they go through a seasonality. And so attempting to grow them in aquaculture on long lines like you might do with mussels is certainly feasible, but it's not easy for a couple of reasons. You have to understand the life cycle of this plant is a very complex life cycle which has been problematic to solve and address. And you've got the seasonality of it, you've got warming waters from changes in current flows. We have relatively low levels of nutrients compared to other parts of the world, in Australia and in particular in South Australia. So it's a challenge. You can do it and you could make a few dollars if that was your objective. Uh, but if you need to do it at scale, which is the reason I started the company more than four years ago, was to impact climate change at scale with urgency. Gigaton scale by 2030. You need to find a way for it to be financially viable with pretty good profit margins so other people will lend large amounts of money to keep building it, both here and around the world. And so you gravitate to how do I grow it on land? And you can grow it on land today. It's done already for uh, many species of marine, uh, marine aquaculture. 
but growing it on land has inherent issues with it too. The physical cost of the acquisition of the land. You need, in many cases, not all, pipes from the ocean to come in so that you can utilize that. Filtration systems, pumps, you now have to provide all the nutrients, the carbon dioxide that's normally taken from the ocean, which is a good thing, that would reduce acidification at large scale, but you now have to supply that. The nitrogen and phosphorus that might normally be there as part of that nutrient mix, you have to supply it. You have to supply light in certain ideally frequencies and, and amounts in here, and you need contained systems. They will have an inherent cost to them, so it's not cheap to do. Uh, but it's feasible and you can make a slightly better profit than what you can make out of the ocean. Probably still not enough though to be able to scale it at a massive scale. So what we've done um, is, is actually look for ways to drive down the final cost of what that raw material product is actually going to be. And the big expensive parts of how do you grow it in contained systems and how do you process it to preserve those bioactives and those little vesicles is critical. And we found some very unique ways that we filed some IP on and we believe we can bring those costs down tenfold. Now that gets us into a, a profit margin range that very large scale lenders, and I mean people who write minimum $200 million US dollars check sizes to build next levels of scale like. And we know that because we're in very intensive conversations with them. So that's actually what we're doing now, both in South Australia and in New Zealand, we're a US headquartered company because that's where I live. But we have a wholly owned Australian subsidiary, a wholly owned New Zealand subsidiary. Um, and that's where we'll be building, we are building, and we'll continue to build those first level scaled production facilities of which we've already partnered for all of the outflow. And we'll continue to refine it, but we know we're in those ranges where scale is, is feasible because cost value to produce is in the range where people are willing to write very large checks, if you can validate your financial proposition. So I, I get what we get out of it, I get what the planet gets out of it, but what do the farmers get out of it? If you can do it at scale, I mean, you're obviously going to be targeting farmers that are feedlots, dairy, high intensity farming, but what do they win out of this? So uh, it's a two part answer. So. Um, today, when you go to the grocery store and you make choices on what you buy, whether it's milk or chocolate, I'm using these as good examples because they're derived from milk, milk or chocolate or ice cream or cheese, and one sitting there and says low carbon, it becomes a more attractive proposition, especially as the younger folks who think our generation has done bad things to the planet, mostly deserved, but um, I'm trying to do my part to help rectify that. You know, they have a stronger desire to take those products that are better for the planet. And so companies who produce them have a high level of interest in sourcing materials that can go into their products that help them make those claims. So our customers are actually those very large scale groups who are in the value chain. Uh, or in some cases, entire countries who have an interest to reinvigorate their agricultural sector and their GDP that's dependent upon large-scale uh, agriculture. So their interest is that, and so that's r sort of really where uh, the user at the end of the day is the farmer, be it a dairy or a, or a beef farmer. And so what we've tried to ensure that the value proposition to the farmer is net positive. They put money in their pocket. It cannot be a cost to them overall. So how do they derive value? There's a value to the carbon that's reduced. And so we're working on what those methodologies are so they're claimable and bankable in that sense. There's, uh, the data is now becoming to emerge that there's an increase in productivity of those same cows. So instead of burping methane out, it's lost calories. The hydrogen and the carbon that would normally go out, about 12 to 15% of every calorie goes out that way in the cow, stays in the rumen. And if you can direct it back into making more protein, the cow can make more protein, more milk and more beef. And 
there's an increase in farm gate prices. Not everywhere around the world, but it's beginning to emerge that the farmer can get paid more for that low carbon product because those large scale corporations who want to buy it. Do. So when you add all those numbers up and the cost of what it will eventually be, it's a net positive, a way net positive for the farmer. They create value out of it. And we're working now with a couple of medium sized feedlots in Australia to, to refine that proposition right now. So. So you can actually have a low carbon cow. We'll get our meat with, you know, methane friendly cow, which will have a market. Correct. It has a big market in certain markets. Perhaps less so in Australia today, but I can tell you there's a very high demand in North America and some parts of Asia in here. And so we're helping some of our customers think about how to get their product in the hands of those who want it uh, and completing some of that connectivity as well. And I think, Katrina, you wanted to yeah, I'm just there on, on users? No, I'm just, I'm just really interested in where, um, with the proposition Steve's putting forward there, and it's very compelling, but it, it's absolutely... Um, the, the area I work in a lot is social license, environmental sustainability, and the, our fundamental premise is can see we'd save the world. And I've, I think I've gone down to a definite maybe on there. Um, <laughs> And the interesting bit in it is in, in going, in the ways in which we can approach it, and there are multiples, and this is a really good example of one, um, there are trade-offs. And that's why I think talk, conversations like this are really important, because uh, what Steve's pointed out is to be able to achieve the outcomes you want with feedlot cattle and methane reduction, we're talking about massive scale production. And that's you know land-based aquaculture systems at very large scale to produce this sort of thing. Now, in a social license context, some people might not mm. be as, as comfortable with that. But what we need to talk about is how the, the whole picture fits together to understand that it's not just a seaweed farm for an individual profitability, it's where it fits into the, the whole. And alongside that, there might be a small scale farmer producing um, um, a, a grow your own farm producing seaweed as a protein replacement and it is also chipping away at, at saving the world and I find it quite challenging sometimes when the two are compared because they're very different propositions and you've got to look at the big picture benefits from both of them and you know you'll still have people who are opposed to the small um, farm in a single bay in a single area as opposed to what we actually need in this case if to achieve the ambitions that Steve has is significant intensive farming of seaweeds. And, and they're on different time scales yes. to address different fundamental problems. The way I look upon it pretty simply, we don't get to 2030 goals of dramatic gigaton reductions in scale. It's sort of not sure how much it matters what happens in the 2040s and 2050s and 2060s futures because the world will fundamentally change in terms of the intensity and the way weather patterns are and parts of the world that will become uninhabitable uh, compared mm. to where they are today, either through temperatures or lack of rain. Mm. And so our goal is to prevent that yeah. or mitigate it or slow it down. Everything Katrina says, I 100% agree with the transition from a beef intensive diet, just to be clear, 75% yeah. of all of the calories we consume on this planet as a planetary species are plant-based. You may be surprised at that, but that's what the data is. But moving away from beef is a transition over decades. We can't do it today. There is no other source to provide us with the roughly 30% of the proteins today on the but world. But it is, it is a really important point that the solution is the whole. Of course. But what we don't want to get to is people say, we can have more cows because we've got this. Agreed. That's, that's like... <laughs> <laughs> the last thing we need is, is more, more cows. <laughs> but I want to come back to a, a topic you touched on from social licence and the, the idea of there being a number of different industries and communities that pin off from this, because it leads to, really, that asparagopsis is a beautiful, specific example of the blue economy. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could tell us a bit more, then, okay. about the blue economy. Yep, so you've um, probably heard it as a word, a buzzword, moving, uh, floating around in the media. Um, so the blue economy is really just all of the ways in which we can use our oceans and coastal areas to help support um, us economically in terms of livelihood, in terms of um, 
uh, protein production, um, the potential there is huge. And it, it is, it's almost like the agricultural revolution kicking off again. Hopefully we'll learn from the mistakes in that and, and do it better this time around. Uh, and I'm optimistic now that conversations such as this help us do that. It helps us be much more open about um, what the expectations in that industry are and, and what the, the challenges are and the risks as well as the opportunities. I think we have to be really clear about that. But there are significant ones. Um, the blue economy covers everything from renewable energy sources, which um, uh, are expanding all over the world now, and, and Australia is um, fr front and forth at the forefront of some of these initiatives in the blue economy around wave and wind in offshore environments, um, to aquaculture production and how do we sustainably manage our existing marine resources, so our fisheries resources and our ecosystems that are there. And the really important bit in that, that one is that we're having those conversations connectedly. It's not in isolation anymore. We're not just dealing with the fishery just dealing with the aquaculture. It has to be the whole picture. Um, and I see it happen quite a lot in government and in science, and it's more and more happening in the community. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that we're moving away from the, the, the community's more educated and understanding. They're more interested, I think, and we're moving away from sort of just pure nimbyism as the issue that's being sort of the not in my backyard to actually really wanting to understand what are the pros and cons of this and why might I back something that I maybe wouldn't have before or why is this truly not a good idea no matter how good your sales pitch is. And if you're setting up blue economy, and we're moving to kind of a different way of thinking about how we um, manage um, natural resources, um, it is very important to bring along local communities because they're now changing yep. the way they do things. Yep. So there's local communities in general, but also First Nation communities in particular. So when you're thinking about in the, in the CRC for marine products, when you're thinking about communities on that global scale, how do you factor them in generally and um, Indigenous communities, First Nations communities in particular. Um, and after you've answered that, I'd like Steve yeah. to comment about how C4 Global have done it with the Narunga people um, over on York and their peninsula. Yeah, no, it, it's really critical. The, the, the First Nations communities are the ones, they're the traditional custodians of these lands and they're their uh, cultural understanding and cultural resource management is um, we haven't even really tapped into that, uh, and it's you know it's shame on us that we haven't, but we are now. Um, I was just part recently. I was trying to think last week, week before the International uh, Seaweed Symposium was held down in Hobart, and there was a, an indigenous workshop held there that um, brought together First Nations from New Zealand, from T uh, Tasmania, Australia, uh, more broadly, and uh, connected in with the Canadian First Nations, and the ability to share that knowledge. And I think. It was really exciting in that meeting because they were sharing the knowledge amongst themselves with then a view to sharing it to us and, and expanding on that. Um, we've got a lot to move forward in that space. I think the Marine Bioproducts CRC is working quite strongly in that space mm -hmm. around uh, identifying not just jobs and opportunities. This is about truly you know, how this can actually be embedded in the community and how we can actually acknowledge indigenous intellectual property and their rights in this space. So trying to get it right now, um, and, and it will be hard. It'll be a tough journey and we won't get it right all the time. Um, but moving it forward is really important. And I think the potential and the opportunity, mm. even in the, we're tapping into some of the cultural resource knowledge. And I have been very surprised personally, not just about what that means in terms of the product potential, the market potential of some of our um, native seaweeds, since we're talking about seaweeds, but also the depth of understanding about how these seaweeds and our natural environment can tell us about the history of climate change, the dynamic of our systems. Um, sometimes we come in and try and impose our understanding, but if we do it as a shared understanding, we learn so much more. Absolutely, and in fact, CH4 have been working closely. So, again, I'll, I'll come back to this question of social license, um, although it's certainly not an area of, <clears throat> of expertise of mine whatsoever. I can just give you our company's experience. So as we are exploring locations to grow on land that has all of these great characteristics, lots of sunlight, relatively flat land, access to water, um, the Air Peninsula 
jumps out at you. Here's low cost marginal land that's really not used for much else because it gets almost no rainfall and it's pretty flat for most of it. And so as we've engaged, in fact, it's where our initial operations are right now um, in a couple of locations there. But as we've engaged with the local communities, they've embraced the possibility not only for us to build some of the operational scale there, but for the other industries that that will attract. Because mm. as we build the scale, we're not going to put down the concrete that's required in some of the pieces or the coverings. That's what the community will be able to bring together. So it's become very attractive. What, what I think what worries some of those folks is the scale that we're talking about. It's like, how are we going to have houses for that many extra people? That's a challenge that's worth taking on, of course, if you're one of those communities. So bringing back jobs, bringing back senses of community in generally economic depressed areas of regional locations, not only in South Australia, but around the world, is one of our objectives. It just happens it also has some of the great characteristics. Now, with respect to Narunga specifically, it's a journey we've been on for the last several years. We've already publicly announced uh, here a couple of years ago a heads of agreement. We're close to finalizing now uh, what a partnership, what a relationship would be like for anything on the York Peninsula, their native home for 50,000 years. And so we'll be working with Narunga to bring not only economic value, social and cultural value in particular. So the CEO of Naranga Nation, Clinton Wanganin, speaks very eloquently about the impact for his community of being able to bring people back to a sense of purpose that ties back to what they've lived for, for that tens of thousands of years is incredibly powerful to hear Clinton talk about it. And it's something I'm personally proud of that we can help enable. Three of my co-founders are native New Zealanders, Māori. So that's what we'll do there as we expand operations into North America, which we will do later this year. Um, again, the partnerships in certain parts of the country that we can create with uh, you know, first generation uh, Native Americans is going to be a critical part of it. So it's actually the third tenant we have. Impact at scale, put money in farmers' pockets, and partner to build the scale, and in particular piece of that is with First Nations people. So it's simply the right thing to be able to do, and we're able to do that now. So we actually haven't said who the we is. So you may want to tell us a little bit about CH4, and in particular your, your three tenants. So how, how does the community view CH4 as a very different form of company to Monsanto, for example? <laughs> We're only a fraction of the size, so you know, we're, we're a, a startup company. We're about four years old. We've successfully managed to raise you know, quite a bit of money along the way to build both the teams uh, and the capabilities and the messaging around it. We hopefully, please all do this, uh, in the next couple of weeks we'll be in a position to announce a, a fairly sizable, substantial money raise that allows us to build out further the capabilities that we're doing in here. We're about roughly about 40 people at the moment spread across Australia in a couple of locations, New Zealand in a couple of locations, and some of the leadership team, myself included, a CEO, a C COO that's sitting up there, who's from Melbourne originally, but living in uh, the US. So we've built that capability um, in a couple ways that make us, I think, a little bit different. Um, we're certainly not researchers, although I've had an academic research background in my lifetime, but we're not researchers of seaweed. That's the great thing. There are lots of groups around the world and why we're a happy participant within the CRC. The capability that we can access is incredibly good. We don't need to do that fundamental research because it's being done and we can partner in ways to be able to leverage that. The expertise that we've tried to focus on is how do you build it at scale? How do you understand the things that you need to do? Not how do I grow the seaweed? We, we sort of address that and we know enough about being able to do it. But how do you bring costs down so that it has that profitability, as I said, that lets people lend you large scale amounts? And that's where the expertise from our team really is and I think differentiates us from many others 
in this type of business proposition. We've been there. We've worked for global Fortune 50 and 100 companies. We've built billion dollar businesses and brands individually inside of those companies and commercialized more than 40 different products. So we, we understand the world we're moving to and how to be able to manage. It's critically important. It's something that most startups don't have access to. And fortunately, when you retired, you know, I retired 10 years ago, this is what you do in retirement. You figure out what can I do to atone for my sins and how do I bring together a, a robust group of people like-minded to be able to do that um, and committed to it. So, it, 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 you know, that's probably, you know, where one of our biggest differentiators are. I think, you know, a bit of luck along the way at uncovering some things that are critically important, bringing some people in with really key skills, such as Tim, at the right time is critically important, and having the story to be able to share with people who invest. Again, part of the reason that the company is US headquartered, it started as a New Zealand company four years ago but we moved the headquarters to the US in April of 2020 because that's where we could attract the larger scales of money that we needed to be able to build the type of scale that we need along the way. And we've, to date, we've been successful at that. And I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of, and I've lived there for 35 years, and uh, while I love Adelaide, uh, that's home now. That's where my family is, so. Thank you for that, Steve. And it's, you know, it's, it's great to see that startup companies really develop these opportunities. But with all these opportunities come risks, and that's one of the, the important roles that the, the Marine Byproducts and Marine Products CRC does. The challenges, the unforeseen issues, I mean, around monoculture seaweed farming in general and bromoform in particular. How do you tackle the, the sort of the issues around bromoform being harmful to the ozone layer and non-carcinogen, um, those sorts of challenges? And of course, the potential for it to become an escaped weed if you're farming it in the, in the oceans. Yep. Are all of these actual issues or do they actually need to be addressed to bring along the, the community and develop the social license? I might let Steve talk about how it's addressed, but I'll tackle the, the bit about how do we uh, um, bring the problems to the forefront. Yep. And that's where things like um, the CRC, so the cooperative research centres have been set up to bring together um, researchers, industry and government um, as, as stakeholders, is all, all with a view to seeing um, these industries succeed. But they can only succeed when you're open and honest. Yeah. Exactly what you're saying yeah. is about what the challenges are and, and how we address those. So there's the, the actually addressing the, the real scientific issue with some of these. So you talked about some of the toxicity issues, and I'll let you talk to that in a second, Steve. But there's also the, the issues around um, perceptions and what people's understandings of issues are. And the one thing I've learned um, often in the community, people can have perceptions. Every scientists know the answers because they've done all the work, but they've not talked about it. It's not out there yet. So a large part of this is, is also making sure that we ad address the concerns people have no matter what they are, and, and find ways through that. And the CRC is very much part of that. But it's also, um, I'll pick up on the one you said about scale. It's really important having the industry as partners in this, because one of the things researchers do very well is understand a problem in detail, but it's often in a lab-based scale. And those problems can be quite different when you take them out to commercial scale. And I think that uh, if we don't have the partnerships like the CRC, we miss that. We miss that opportunity, and I think that's really critically important, and that's what these CRCs do. Um, and there was a third part to your question that I've forgotten. That. I think, well, I guess it, it really is about how we actually deal with the messaging around the, the negatives. So we can actually ah. address the negatives in sp specifics, but yep. yes, with social media, uh, but with the, the you know, approach to take any alternate view as yep. um, equal. Yeah, so. so on that, um, it's transparency in results and information and, and transparency around the issues and how we're dealing with them. And whilst I'd say any amount of scientific reports can go out there, um, 
people actually, th they make decisions in part with the information they're given, but with a large part with this, their gut feel and their heart. Mm. And so actually being able to talk to people about what the issues are is, is gold compared to actually giving out a report. So uh, all credit to uh, Planet Talks, Will Adelaide for doing this sort of thing that gives us the opportunity to, to share with you the knowledge that we have, but also the uncertainties that we have. I think that's the other one I, I find. Um, often people think there's certainty in making a decision. You only go forward when you know everything about something. That's not life. You go forward with uncertainty. It's how you deal with that uncertainty. And that's the openness uh, to talk about what the issues are and, and try and address them and the transparency and the information on the other side. And I'll let you talk to the yeah, cause that's, detail. That's where bromoforms are a yep. really good example of the fact that people can read something on the internet and then um, manufacture it or magnify it to become a, a genuine threat. So Generally manufactures. Yeah. yeah, and the important one in that is everybody will go away from here having heard what we've got to say, but you'll form your own opinion about who was right, what was wrong, how much of it was real, what it means to you. I and mean, hopefully we've moved you a little bit forward in that thinking. But so a quick answer comment the about, because many of our, uh, our listeners and watchers will have heard about bromoforms and know some of their challenges. So let me dispel some of those. So as uh, almost all seaweed that creates the biomass on the planet from seaweed is in the oceans today. There is very little 30 million tons in Northeast Asia produced, but that's a small amount compared to the total biomass. And as you heard me say today, all seaweeds produce these halogenated, not just bromoform, you know, it intends to get singled out. I will categorically tell you that bromoform is not the only active that produces this benefit. It is the 100 of them that are in there. In fact, if you use just bromoform, you only get 30 to 40% of the benefit, unless you increase the dose significantly. So let's think about it from an ozone standpoint, and I'll give it to you this way. All of that biomass, that massive amount of biomass, is equilibrating when the seaweed processes it. It's released into the ocean. There's a certain concentration, the ocean equilibrates with the atmosphere and you have a certain amount of these volatile materials in the atmosphere. They can be degrading of ozone. What's there is what's there today, right? So the question is, is there more harm that's done by aquaculturing at large scale a seaweed, any seaweed? But we'll use asparagopsis in this particular case because it helps make the point. If you want to have a viable product at the end of the day, your entire operations are set up to preserve the integrity of those membranes to keep those volatile materials inside. If they escape, you have a useless product. Don't want to spend a lot of money and effort trying to make something that in fact has no utility in the market. So all of the work we do in the careful controls uh, to preserve the integrity of that. And we test it all the way through, so we know we have effectively no loss. So not only are we, uh, you know, we're not contributing in any way, shape or form, and even if it all escaped, the amount is a fraction of 1% of that total. So the, the impact on it, again, can it? Of course, that's what happens today. Does it at any level of scale? The answer is no. And there are some well-written scientific publications now from physicists and, sci and other scientists who have in fact gone through and described that, specifically actually related to, to Australia. Um, in terms of its toxicology, I can give you a reference to a 205-page United States Department of Health and Human Services toxicology report on bromoform specifically, not the other ones in there, and it says it's toxic. But if I drank eight of those in 30 minutes sitting here, it's also toxic and I'll likely die. So you have to understand the whole point of toxicology is what is the threshold at which it becomes. And in the top world of toxicology, it's called a margin of safety. How much can I take and how much is, would likely cause a problem? And to give you an example, a cup of coffee, which probably many of you had this morning and perhaps even during the day. If you drank 268 cups of coffee, you've reached that margin of safety and you're gonna have an issue. Let's leave aside the palpitations you may get if you're more sensitive. 
but from an overt toxicology standpoint, the margin of safety is 268. At the dose that we use, compared to all of the written scientific data over the last 30 years, the margin of safety for bromoform at the amount we use in the way we use it, the entire plant, is 10,000 fold. So is it toxic? Absolutely. Is it toxic in what we do? No, and there are now dozens of publications that have looked at the effect of providing it to animals at doses that we use and higher ones. Is there anything in the blood, the urine, the tissues, the feces, et cetera, et cetera? Does it change the taste, texture of milk or beef? And the answer is unequivocally no to all of those, with one publication exception that used doses that were not in line with what you would use in a commercial application for it in here. So the answer is, it's a problem for the ozone layer and it's a problem for toxicology. You just have to understand the context of it. Now, if I was making a pure bromoform, because you can't buy it uh, commercially, so if I was a company and I was making it, not only am I going to have to be very careful and aware of manufacturing and the human exposure in making it, synthesizing it in here, then when I formulate it into products, it's at a very high concentration when I give it to animals. A question that needs to be addressed that has not been addressed yet. If I'm extracting it out of the seaweed, we take the whole seaweed, we grow it, we remove the water, and that is the final product. Nothing added, nothing else taken out. But if I extract, try to extract those actives out of there, the way it's done today is I don't quite know how much I'm getting, but what I get is now concentrated into a different phase. It's no longer got seaweed in it at all. Uh, and again, so it has different questions that still need to be addressed than those that have been addressed with the native seaweed in its entire intact space. So again, context is really important of how you do it and the questions that you need to answer. So yep. so that's a really good segue into the last section, which is really the future. Um, so I'd like to start with you, Katrina. The future for seaweeds in general, other pharmaceuticals, edibles, diet, um, it's, is seaweed the, the, the future for us all? It has huge potential. It really does. And that's um, being part of the MBCRC has really allowed me to see the broad scope of the applications of seaweed. So, you know, everything from our standard sea salt that you put in the plants in the garden, and uh, don't underestimate that. The potential of seaweed to be really effective in that space is, is amazing. And I think I mentioned earlier the. Um, the ability to utilize that to offset some of our um, traditional farming practices and some of the less sustainable um, approaches to fertilizers on land is a really good benefit. So that's that side, the well-known side. The food side of seaweed, it's been there for many, many years, Southeast Asia. Um, it's a cultural um, presence throughout Southeast Asia, but it's increasingly becoming seen the potential in, in Australia. And, and that's not just as food that's tasty, that's good for you. Um, seaweeds can have up to 30% proteins, so there's a real opportunity there. But there's some really good, um, these health benefits, you know, the, the sort of things we see in cattle in terms of immuno, um, Benef immuno benefits, immune system benefits, um, anti-carcinogens, antivirals, fucidins and laminarians, the big kelps have some, some really exciting um, biochemical properties that um, Maranova in Tasmania has already been exploiting that for many years or been working on that for many years, but there's other companies in Tasmania starting to, in Australia, sorry, that are starting to work on that. But even beyond that, there's some really innovative and novel applications to seaweed. So you've got the bioplastics, the biopackaging um, applications that are starting to evolve. There is um, textiles. I've seen some amazing textiles made out of seaweeds, and that's a, another... Uh, a necklace. A, it, it is beautiful. It is kelp. <laughs> um, but yes, there's, there's a, a whole range of applications there. But one of the things that came across really exciting, it was a student project that I, I was involved with briefly, and he was actually looking at the to use seaweed as a pin board, you know, as a textural material, and discovered that a couple of the seaweeds he had had really high fire retardant properties. And so that starts to look at it something you can add to building materials for a real value proposition there. And that is carbon sequestration right there in amongst it, if you can get the seaweeds into those. So those potentials 
are they're just we're just touching into them. And the first phase of the marine um, uh, byproducts CRC is actually looking at that, helping industries to see that potential and start to grow. And then the other side of it will be to take that much further. You know, and the real advantage, I'm starting to sound like a seaweed advocate here, haven't I? That's what we so want. One of the big things that blows me away with seaweed is if you start to grow it, that one plant that you're growing can actually tap into all those market opportunities. So you're not just growing it as a fertilizer, you could be growing it as a high-end wound dressing and you know, as a nutraceutical supplement for um, whether it's humans or animals, and there's a big market in pets at the moment, um, or down to that fertilizer. You can have a fully integrated business across that. And that's really exciting because it's not something that a lot of our terrestrial or, or traditional farming approaches, even our traditional aquaculture approaches, have actually been able to do. So, so huge. fantastic. And Steve, then, last question the future of asparagopsis? Well, I think. Um you know, the scale question needs to be addressed. Can, can we, and I'm saying it both broadly in the industry as well as us as a company, validate that we can actually, we can build the scale facility. We're building it now, so let's be clear on that. Can it meet the financial metrics to be able to then scale it at large scale to have this impact on climate change? We believe it does, and all of the work that we have that's been focused on that should enable us to get there. Um, I may get the number wrong, so I know it's being live streamed and taped in here, but for Australia's total cattle population, which is sort of in the 27-ish million cows, we could grow enough uh, just in South Australia to supply that on something like, and I'm sort of looking up to Tim, somewhere six or 700 hectares. Not a lot of space when you consider the massive size of Air Peninsula. Um, actually quite a small space and that's a possibility now I'll tell you that that's in the ballpark of a six billion dollar industry just on that alone excluding any carbon value and that's about another eight billion dollars that's the potential for what can come of it just within Australia on a, on a global context uh, which is as we validate that financial we will build them out uh, in line with partnerships, some of these big, large global companies are where does they want their supply chain coming from? Um, and they, they may say, I'm happy to have it from Australia because it's going to be one of the lowest cost, types quality products that can be there. That's a conversation we engage in. But the unique thing is that, that the accessible amount of space that has almost no other use is perfect for this and it brings communities together in a way that builds incredible value and impact. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we see our future in here and the potential for it. So stay tuned. And as About a, this time next year, we'll know the answer to that question. And as an point. endemic species, we have a unique advantage here. That is correct. Advantage here. Not an invasive. Nothing, by the way, we use the entire plant. So some of these other benefits that uh, Katrina talked about are incredible. You know, you can have one plant that could have yeah. 10 uses. For us, it's the entire plant. It's very important that it's the entire plant because it keeps the integrity of this fully native, natural, farmed by Australians, for Australia, in Australia, in this particular case, uh, impact, which is an important piece. The same is true in New Zealand. But um, So all of these other benefits are incredibly powerful, but you know, it's, it's native to here, and so being able to leverage and build that for the social, the financial, the, econ or the economic, the cultural impact is incredibly important. Um. So I think, thank you very much for those final comments, an incredibly exciting um, work and future. And we started here with thinking about Paul Chifurka and his, his graphs about the, the, the enormous challenges that the planet faced faces um, because of us and our domestic animals and the almost overwhelming problems that we face around methane and obviously climate change. One of the things about Paul Chifurka is that he was a collapsologist um, and he, um, like many of us working in this area, became incredibly depressed about the overwhelming problems that, that we face in, in trying to save the planet and save life on Earth. And in fact, it's an enormous, it's enormous issue for people working in this space, uh, conservation depression um, and this sorts of real despair that people can have working this space. 
and he argued that you actually need to take a step back from looking at the overwhelming problem and work on solutions, whether they be little bits, reasonable sized bits, or in this case, rather large bits, and taking a, an approach that makes a difference. And I think one of the really exciting things we've heard today is from Katrina around seaweeds in general and Steve around asparagopsis in particular, that they are doing something. They're acting, they are bringing about change that will make a difference. And that's the best response, really, towards dealing with the despair of collapsology and the end of the world that we know it. So I would like you all, please, to join with me to thank Katrina and thank Steve. <laughs>